What is up folks, Casual Dad here with another Warhammer Combat Card stream. Tonight we're going to go ahead and dive in and actually build a deck. So uh, I've got a quest up to win three games with Skulltaker. I really enjoy Chaos as a faction and really especially enjoy Skulltaker himself for his ability. Uh, when he came out I was really excited because I was really struggling with Akaran and struggling to find a Warlord that I really enjoyed uh, and I really really liked playing with him. But that said, I've really had a hard time making him stick. Uh, I just sort of peak at around 3k, like 2.999k, <laughs> 2 and he just sort of sits there, and I rarely am able to progress beyond that. I see decks that are higher than that, but I rarely get there myself. So, uh, just to talk about Skulltaker, he's, he's in the mid-range of points, is sitting at 36, he's not on the upper end, he's not at the lower end, he's smack in the middle, and his stats are kind of there as well. And mine is actually pretty close to smack in the middle in terms of level, too. Uh, he's sitting at a really good melee damage, decent hit points, and again, kind of a reasonable cost. Uh, but he doesn't have any other attack stat aside from melee. And one of the other things that really hurts him is his debuff is not particularly helpful. Um, just because chances are you're going to want a melee debuff or a melee buff in an endgame that's close, and he doesn't offer that. So you'd need a bodyguard to do that for him. Uh, also, he doesn't have all that many hit points, and his melee damage is good, especially with Furious Charge, but his secondary trait of Berserk, especially maxing out at rank 2, is not very impressive. Um, so he can finish a game, but really only against a squishy opposing Warlord that win a game you're already winning. So you really need his bodyguards to do a lot of the work for him. Um, and then his ability, of course, just to go ahead and talk about that. Uh, after attacking an enemy card with a melee attack, the opponent card would be left with 25 or less health. It is instead destroyed. That's weird wording. The reason for that is so that it does work to finish off Akaran cards. So an Akaran card, it's not if you do lethal damage. It's specifically written to allow for taking out that second life. So if you do lethal damage, it comes back. This triggers to kill that card with that remaining 5 health instead. Um, really powerful ability, and there are kind of two ways to read this. Just like the Necron Warlord Uthakar, you can read this as either supercharging cards that already have really good melee, which is definitely a really good way to look at it, because it pushes them just over the edge. The other way to look at it, though, is especially on especially if you're attacking cards that have medium or low health, it supercharges your weaker cards as well. So if you have a card with 5 melee damage, it'll still finish off an opposing card that has 30 or, or less health. So just kind of another way to think about it while we're looking at these cards. Uh, and so just to look at the deck I've got, this is pretty standard, what I've kind of been tinkering with. Um, the Poison Terminator has been one of my mainstays. Of course, one of the best melee cards in Chaos that Chaos has is World Claimer. And then everything else is sort of fuzzing, just kind of fudging around. Um, Furious Charge does trigger that kill ability, which is really, really powerful, so I have two of those in there. Um, also, for clearing out power cards, you do kind of want that target acquired. I have a Ready just as a filler, another Poison just because he's quite good as a filler. And then, of course, your Lucius the Eternal for durability. Now, he, I think, is basically an auto-include when you get him to level 9 or above. Below level 9, it's a little bit more questionable um, as to whether or not his cost and hit points and having endless are going to be better than shields. Uh, most of the time, I would think that shields are going to be a little bit better, but there are cases where if something is just sort of plinking away at you with low damage, or if it's something like poison or something like that, um, Lucius can actually hit harder. And now one of the reasons I say he's kind of an auto-include to that Furious Charge is again that that Furious Charge does trigger Skulltaker's ability, but then also, after the first copy is killed, the second copy of Furious Charges again. So he can actually counter-kill an opposing card and do a surprising amount of burst melee damage, even though it's not that high. Again, it's kind of in the middle of the road, which is supercharged by Skulltaker's ability, especially being able to do it twice. So really, really good, but mine is just but actually being epic, it's going to be a while before I level through that. So we're going to take him out. I'm actually going to clear this entire deck. And then we're going to start from scratch. So just a couple things I'm thinking about here. I want to make sure that I'm able to tackle some of the real scary cards, the real scary parlor, uh, warlords out there. One of the big ones being Akaran, especially since his ability is really good against that. But also Badrek. Those are kind of the two really bad matchups I want to be able to handle. Uh, but then, just in general, his staying power has been a little bit lacking, so I want something a little bit different. And one of the challenges I've had is leaning really hard on a melee deck that really sort of 
pigeonholes me and I end up in bad matches where I don't want to hit something in melee and I have no other option. Um, psychic and ranged, even if you're always activating on melee, they do give you a counterattack that still gives you some val valuable contribution to the match, even if you are not actively doing melee. Okay, so thinking about that. So I'm looking for staying power, I'm looking for an attack variety. Ideally, I want to sit in a spot where uh, I'm not super vulnerable to Big Game Hunter. So the more cards I have under 40 points, the better. And kind of where I'd like to start right off the bat, and I'm going to talk through this, my sort of process here, and then I'm actually going to do a couple games. Um, you could always go all corn, but what I found is that ends up being a really, really bursty deck that against something like Rakarth, Fear, or Shields, really kind of loses steam, and then you end up with Skulltaker in, in an unfavorable endgame. Um, so I don't want something quite that straightforward aggressive, even though I may end up with a Bloodthirster in here, I'm not going to build around that. So again, talking about a variety of attack stats, let's see what you got here. This would be such a good card, and this is another thing to consider, of course, is the current level of your cards. When I get in this upper tier here, this guy would be, or these guys, this, would be, would be an absolute no-brainer to put in there. Decent cost, great stats, really flexible, has that Furious Charge and Inspire, uh, but mine is at a low, low level 4, and just not very impressive, so I'm not going to do that one. Uh, I am going to go ahead and try the, the Lord of Change, just because it has that regen, which gives me a little staying power, has a lot of hit points, has an okay melee attack, so I'm not taking it for the melee, but has that area effect blast to clear shields, clear damage cards, and it's just a really, really obnoxious, powerful piece. Now that's a piece you want to put in there usually with a heal card. Kind of looking at those. This is another case where I would put Bile in here in a second, except I'm somewhat concerned about his level. Couple more levels up, he'll be significantly better. Right now he is um, Berserk Bait. The last thing you want to do is Poison Rank 1, a Berserk card. And there are quite a few Berserk cards floating around the board right now. Um, so I question him. I would probably consider him. Talking about durability, this guy is one of your best bets. Decent cost, great shields, has both ranged and melee stat. Really, really does well in a Skulltaker deck. And if I'm looking at a combination between a variety of attack stats, he's got that ranged attack. Uh, and again, shields. So he takes the place of Fabius. Not Fabius, excuse me, Lucius. Jeez. Um, he kind of slots in here. Just looking through these, kind of this 20 point range is where I want to play around. I do want a decent level of melee, so I'm going to throw him in there because he's got a really great combination of attack, power, trait for fear for the durability, and cost. At 22 points, this guy is an absolute bargain, especially kind of in this upper level range. And mine is leveled to the point where I kind of feel okay taking him. Another thing I'm going to do that's going to be... Another card I'm considering is this guy here. Only has melee, which is a bummer, but he's a decent cost with a really good hit points and has that rank 3 regen. Um, his melee is a little bit low for me to really consider him here, but he's definitely someone I'm thinking about. Uh, again, too, I also probably want to throw some taunt in here for defense. And thinking about kind of Chaos's strengths as a faction, one of the things they have that it's really, really good is they have those 3 and 4 point taunt cards that are really great, but... They're also very low hit points, and if I think about the biggest weaknesses of Skulltaker, a lot of them are going to be really hard shooting decks like uh, the Tau decks that are out there, sometimes Tolmeron, and then also, of course, um, Bad Ruck. In all of those cases, bringing one of those really cheap taunts is almost a liability. So if you're going to put a taunt in here, you want a more expensive one. And now here I'm already hitting a bit of a wall there. Right after saying I want a more expensive one, I'm looking at only 33 points left to put in here. And let's see, so we want ways to deal with shields. Poison is a very good one. I do like this guy, but we're talking, I also mentioned I want a variety of attack types, so I do think I still want my little poison dude in here. Where's my 11 pointer? This guy right here. Slots in neatly at a really good price point, does both melee and ranged. Really, really good about dealing with fear cards that can kind of stick around a bit because he's got high level poison, minus rank three poison. If he got to rank four poison, it'd be an absolute blast. Uh, and then we're looking at 22 points remaining. It's a very thin deck, so I'm a little concerned about that. So I want to lean towards both durability and hitting power. Uh, this is another good one. His melee is a little bit low, but my best performing Skulltaker deck, he was in there. So we'll go ahead and put that in there. Left with only five points. 
I'm probably going to revisit this and drop the Lord of Change, but we'll see how this goes first. So we're talking five points. Uh, hmm. One of the classic cards to include would be your uh, blood letter over here. I think I'm going to opt for this guy. Think about Silas. He's one of the squishier endless cards, but he is endless. He's at the same price point as your Nurglings. He's got a melee buff, which is consistent with most of my other buffs here, but also he has a ranged attack. He's the only endless card here, aside, especially at that price point, that gives you a ranged and melee attack. So if you need to clear some shields, if you want to do a little bit extra, he really pushes that a bit. So he's definitely one to consider if you're already putting in that three to five point endless card in here. Uh, another option, of course, is going to be your this guy here, but not being endless, he's got the better attack stats but it's not really worth it if you're trying to clog up a lane you want your endless card. So we're going to try this, we'll see how it goes. Uh, another reason I chose to do this tonight is the timing. We're wrapping up, we're kind of in the middle of week three of the latter season and I'm in the 12k deck range. So I'm seeing fairly competitive decks, but they're not the true face stompy ones where I would just lose nonstop. So I expect to have some close games here if I'm kind of on the right mark, um, but not to get completely wrecked is the hope. And so here, I don't want to play my shield cards yet, because I don't really need to. Then we get the Lord of Change. So the deck is a little bit thin, which is bad, because it doesn't give me that many cards to run through. But I do have two shielded cards, a really good fear card, and a regen card with a lot of hit points. So even though I don't have kind of the durability in terms of number of cards, the cards I do have really do kind of make up for that by being quite a bit tankier than your average. Also, I do have that variety of attack types, so I can actually alternate attack types and build up buffs on my side and play off those debuffs on my side. You just saw me do a Psychic and a Melee debuff, both of which are going to serve me well here. And I got lucky here going up against Rakarth. It is Rakarth, so it's going to be a challenging matchup, but it is also, it looks like a Psychic one, so I'm going to get to be able to do my Psychic debuffs. It's Psychic... Ooh. That was a little painful. Psychic with the fallback of melee. So if I'm nailing him with, um, oh, this isn't the best way to do it. If I'm also nailing him with the Lord of Change, whether he does melee or psychic, this is a bad matchup for the AI, which is exactly what I want. So there, normally he would do psychic, no brainer. But because I've got the Lord of the Change on the table, he opted for melee instead, which allowed me to do a pretty devastating counterattack. Now, I did see, so far there's only been one Psyker, we'll see if there are more. Nope. You're brutal. And here, this is a perfect case of why I wanted to go this route. So, normally, in an all Skull Taker deck, I'm looking at a lineup of melee cards I do not want to punch. Uh, I want to do pretty much anything aside from punch those. So, um... And having an actual meaningful non- melee attack is going to be really important to giving your skull taker that sort of extra level of um, that extra dimension to make him a little bit more effective in more matchups Ooh, that was close and now here this puts me in a really great spot where I, he's only got two more cards left awesome so incarn uh could be better could be a lot worse let's put our shield over here to hold him down if he does melee i'm going to just wail on this guy if he does He's going to be hitting me with melee, because that's his most advantageous shot. And I'm going to hit him right back with Psychic, and I'll be counterattacking melee and hitting him with Psychic. So this worked out really, really well. And you can see the importance of those shield cards, otherwise he'd be just chainsawing right through my Lord of Change. So this protects the Lord of Change, and the Lord of Change is really the one doing most of the work. A couple things I want to watch out for. I really want to watch out for Target Acquired. Uh, and then I do also want to watch out for decks that have really good melee or range. Let's see. Math. Math is hard. So I'm going to go ahead and go for it. If this was a closer matchup, I wouldn't do this. Uh, I didn't quite get him, but Skulltaker's finishing move will kill him, even if he heals a couple times here. And he still isn't going to have enough to go through the Lord of Change. I think I've got him anyway, no matter what he does. Yeah, he did ranged. Yeah. He did ranged so as not to die. Yeah, so what we saw there was a relatively lean Rakarth deck. Still very scary. Uh, there was no reason to take that for granted, and I, there were some plays that could have gotten me in trouble, and my sort of typical Skulltaker deck would have struggled with that, 
because I wouldn't have had the alternating attack types or the heavy psychic attack to really lean on in most matchups. That's one of the things to think about that is I do have some ranged attack. I still have the strong melee. So if I go up against a Tolmeron, for example, um, that still will help out. So that was a win. I'm actually not going to edit that. We'll try that again. Yeah, so Tolmeron, I have the option to fall back on Psychic or Melee. Akaran, I have the option to fall back on Melee, while my Psychic counterattack is helping to kind of trim things. This is going to be an interesting one. Um, <laughs> that's the downside of leveling right now, or of sort of practicing right now. Some of the decks I see are going to be a little bit weird, and not ones I'll expect to see at kind of upper tiers. But, I mean, we're in the 2.5 plus K realm, so it's not even... This is not really low tier play. This is upper middle, kind of like top 20% of games. So this is still a great place to be testing these. One thing I do want to be sure to mention, I do see a lot of Artemis. And since I do have a deck that leans pretty heavily on that, <laughs> while I was designing the thing, I talked about wanting to make sure I wasn't um, being too vulnerable to Big Game Hunter, that also means being vulnerable to Watch Captain Artemis with his ability to just shave off a percent of the health of opposing cards. Um, having a thin deck that really leans on that Lord of Change, um, I kind of walked right into some issues with that. That should be plenty. Yeah. So that's going to be my worst matchup. Calling that now, I think if I see an Artemis, I will be in real, real trouble. Uh, if I see a Badrock, I'm not sure how this is going to work either. I have good melee. I've got the Psychic to trim shields and kind of shave stuff. Uh, but I don't really... It's a little hard to wrap my head around how this is going to perform without without actually seeing it. So I do hope I see at least one Badrock uh, so that I get a chance to really test out that matchup. And I'm definitely feeling the kind of leanness of the deck. Not too bad. I still have my kind of full capacity Lord of Change. I've still got three cards in the deck, two bodyguards, at least one of them with full shields to be very, very durable. Um, so this is holding up pretty well. But I still am getting a little nervous just because of how lean it is. And especially because Gazgul himself is going to come out of that deck swinging real hard. And I better have something to take that hit. Which I should. I should have a full lineup here. He's got one more bodyguard, so I'm really going to be able to put... Ooh, gross. Alright, alright. But that still is good, because I've got an almost full health... Well, not almost full health, but still a pretty healthy fear card right there to stand up against him. Ooh, it's a high level one. He's going to be hitting hard, but he's not going to one-shot me on offense or on the Furious Charge. So what you what you want to watch out for is that Furious Charge actually doing lethal, because that'll really mess you up. Uh, that Fear came into play, that ranged counterattack came into play, that shield was clutch. I'm go ahead and hit him. I probably didn't have to do that. Of course I didn't have to do that. I never have to do anything. But then I can kind of rotate my shield in and put another squishy counterattacker in here on the flank to kind of do a little extra damage no matter what attack type he does. <laughs> Maybe it was a bad move, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Skull Taker gets to finish it again. So good news and bad news. Good news, that's 2-0. No. That's good. Bad news, it was against kind of strange decks, and in both cases, Skull Taker did hit the board. Neither one of those should have been a particularly difficult match, um, but both of them did pull Skull Taker. Even if I had a full board and huge advantage up against the Warlord when he popped out, that's good, but it still is a little concerning if I go up against a really scary deck uh, that's going to be potentially a concern. So we'll try again. If I get 3-0, and o, I'll feel pretty good about where this at. This is at. A couple things I do need to watch out for. I talked about Artemis. I talked about questions with Badruck. This is another one I want to watch out for. This is one of the reasons I'm filling with shields, because I've been seeing a lot of Canon S decks, um, and those can really quickly chew through a melee heavy deck, especially one that doesn't have the level of defense that this one does. So being able to fall back on that Psychic and range damage on defense, and also having the melee punch to back it up, and the shields are really going to be critical here. So having both of these guys with shields is great. Having both shield cards, I mean only one's on the board right now, but having both shield cards available to me will be really, really nice. 
Uh, this too, when you're deploying here, you do want to kind of watch what you're up against because I'm looking at a board where he doesn't want to hit in melee because I'll hit back harder. Doesn't want to hit in psychic because he doesn't have psychic. So he's going to do a fair amount of ranged. So placing Lord of Change over here on the left both meant that I'll be less likely to take the um, revenge attacks that Canonist triggers and then also will, in that particular case, have a little chance to regen up some health before I start taking damage. Uh, here I want to kill that guy before he poisons the Lord of Change. Luckily I had built up some melee bonus attack and was able to do that lethal. And then got that too. Oof, so many attacks. <laughs> Man, that guy attacked three times that turn. Uh, Canoness is definitely a warlord to watch out for. She's very, very strong. Especially right now with some of the buffs to legendary and epic cards. But still, a lot of what you see is going to be pretty standard, quote-unquote, um, Canon S. Nothing necessarily outstanding, but just the way the meta's kind of shifted where it's heavy melee, her particular flavor of melee is really, really powerful right now relative to some others. And that's great, actually. I thought I was going to kill the guy in the middle and take a revenge hit. I did not. It's so nice. This is working out well. The variety of attack types, the defense the heavy offense of the Lord of Change, awesome. And Canon S herself is gonna be on the board here. I spoke too soon. <laughs> she wasn't gonna be on the board before, but she is now. Now all three of them will drop. And I still have three cards in the deck. The Lord of Change will be able to clear out some shields pretty aggressively before uh, Skulltaker has to drop, so we might be okay. But this, you can see how this would be a really bad match for, matchup for your kind of standard Skulltaker. And I hit a lot of Canon S decks that really were giving me some trouble. Um, so it is nice to be able to do this. And you're seeing that durability and that counterattack play heavily here as well. Because that's a thing where the, again, traditional Skull Taker really struggles to hit back a lot of heavy melee decks that aren't Chaos hit really hard and ranged as well. So they can fall back on ranged and really kind of weaken your deck before you get a chance to really hit back. So having those heavily defensive cards that also have the ranged attack on defense really helps kind of even that up and forces some bad decisions for the AI that you're playing against. This was a comfortable victory against what could have been a very nasty deck. This, I mean, 3.2k is no joke, but this is a kind of off-meta Canon S deck, had extra taunts, more than you'd see usually, and has this guy over here. Uh, it's a good play to have that really, really beefy card with both a really high ranged attack and then also the um, high ranged, high melee, and also the, oh, lordy, what do you call it, big game hunter on there. That's a scary piece. Uh, and has some serious advantages over a lot of the other cards you would put in there, namely that really heavy ranged attack, the high hit points, uh, and not being a card you want to get killed. So that was a, that was a scary deck, and I'm glad I got to see that matchup. I'm 3-0, feeling pretty good, especially after that last win against a Canon S matchup. Uh, I'm going to do one more and see if I can get an unfavorable matchup. I will say, each of these is one that would have been a lot more difficult with that standard pure melee-focused Skull Taker. This would have been much, much more difficult in those. Okay, we got a Tau deck. Awesome, I get to see that. <laughs> one, <laughs> so, talking about the schedule. Um, Playing ladder games in the third week of the season is good because you get kind of a nice even matchup. It's also bad because a lot of players don't really aggressively level up until kind of the last week. And so you'll play against some extremely scary decks that are rated lower than they should be. So I would be willing to bet that this deck is going to be pretty challenging. We're going to rank three traits, yeah. Uh, pretty challenging. It's going to be Farsight, excuse me, Dark Strider. Um, so this is going to be a great matchup that I really wanted to test out because if I position badly the late game drops of some of the scary, really scary stuff that uh, Tau can bring out will potentially pick off my Lord of Change and put me in a really bad spot the good news is if I have something that can take one of those hits and actually soak it for a turn even if it costs me my Lord of Change that puts me in a much better position to wow, you took some damage, Gordon or Dar. Uh, that puts me in a much better position for Skulltaker to finish off Darkstrider. Darkstrider is one of the warlords that Skulltaker has a favorable matchup against if he has a little bit of defense. And this is great. I'm getting these taunt cards across from the Lord of Change, who's got some time to build up some health with that regen. 
over time so that the late game I'll have a little bit of an edge more than I otherwise would have. Uh, do I do melee? Now here's, I'm pretty sure I will kill the taunt card and then also Gordar will be free to take out. Yeah, okay, perfect. Got on the right. And my fear guy's almost done, but he did great for 22 points. And that's something to also keep in mind as you're looking at this. You're like, oh no, I traded one and two. Oh, but then if you keep in mind the relative points cost, Gordar is, is up. Oof, that was close. Okay, so this one may be appropriately rated, and I, I don't, don't mean any shade on that, just that this guy has this dude instead of one of the really scarier ones. I'm still betting we see either Long Strike or um, blah blah blah, the Barrage Plane. I'm betting on the Barrage Plane being the last card. Yeah, okay. Which is a little bit better, because Long Strike with that attack on drop can really do some bad things um, <laughs> before you get a chance to react, whereas this one is not quite as bad. Alright, so we'll put some extra defense here. I'm going to go ahead and play Skull Taker now, and then we'll see how this melee does. It's possible I can actually take out this plane. Finish you off, and that's kind of a, that was a little bit of a waste, because the Lord of Change could actually do that with, um, could have done that with the Area Effect Blast as well. And now I'm going to lose the Lord of Change. So this is actually going to be a pretty tight matchup. Oof, gross. Wool. So there's every chance I'm going to lose this. Um, both of those Barrage Planes. He's got 49, so he would actually take that out. He will not. Got both those Barrage Planes in there. I wasn't able to finish either one off. And I should have taken the opportunity when I had it to move the Lord of Change so he wasn't directly in the path of that other Barrage Plane. So yeah, he's comfortably got me on this one. Uh, also, I should have just held Skulltaker back a little bit longer. Um, so that was a bad play on my part for a tight matchup. So I'm glad I saw that matchup um, to kind of get a sense of play. So if I'd replayed that, just thinking this back in my head, on that final couple plays where I played Skulltaker to finish off the injured card, I didn't need to do that. What I should have done is put the Endless card on the far right, moved my Terminator to the middle, um, and then allowed the Lord of Changes Area Effect Blast to take out the um, Injured card in the middle, and then probably hit with Psychic, so I would charge up a melee attack. And just to rewind that a little bit, I would have had a melee buff that would have pulled um, Dark Strider without Skulltaker on the board, so Skulltaker would not have taken that hit back. And then in my turn, after losing a couple cards, including the Lord of Change, Skulltaker goes up against Dark Strider, he hits him with his Furious Charge, and then also hits him with his um, buffed melee attack, and that may have been enough to kill him without dealing with all that. <laughs> so I'm going to play another one, and we'll see how it goes. Again, I haven't really had reason to reconsider the deck just yet, and it's been playing favorably, so I really went into this expecting to actually do a couple iterations and a couple deck builds. I think I'm going to stick with this for a minute. Ooh, and we're going to go up against this Psychic deck. That's a good matchup to try out. Okay, you're looking at a Voldus. You see a non-Psyker dropped on the board. You want to put your Psyker across from that guy so that he has a chance to be defensive. Okay, so I'm seeing two cheap players here. Can pretty much guarantee I'm going to see Nyal and Tigurius or one of those two and the Dreadnought. Hi, Tigurius, that's great. And now here I'm probably, yep, see, that's why you don't put something valuable in front, ooh, melee, interesting. So I made him nervous. And also he had enough melee damage to actually, wow, that was, that got weird. He had enough melee damage to actually solo my, uh, solo, is that the word I'm looking for? To take down my endless guy. Not going to kill the guy on the left. I'm going to take some damage on that, which is not great. But I wanted to hit Tigurius with poison. That was my big goal there. Um, and that's why you bring the poison guy to weaken Tigurius here. That may not be the best play. Especially... Oh, jeez. Okay. Especially since I already have some cards in here. Um, stripping his shields. But still. Oh, gross. Now, going to call it that third card. That second to last card before Voldus is going to be the Inspire. No, God, okay. <laughs> In at least one previous 
video, I've talked about how there are a few cards where if I see them across the board, I expect to lose. And this guy is one of the top ones. Um, especially if somebody has him in a deck, chances are he's high level. That is a very, very frightening card to run up against. Pretty much no matter what. We'll go ahead and do that. I'll take the five. Whatever. Uh, pretty much no matter what, but particularly in a matchup where you have to clear other scary psychers as well. Usually he's on a board where you don't have any good targets, and he himself is just absurdly durable. Um, so we'll see how well this durability in this deck goes. Man, okay, I just don't like any of my options here. Oh, how much damage does he do? 118, gross. And that's before the buff he's about to get from Boldus himself. So I've probably lost this as well. Um, but this is a very frightening deck. This is the one I was talking about that's going to be underrated. So this deck can easily perform higher than 2.7k trophies. This is one I expect to see considerably higher than that. It is possible I can still pull this one out, especially since it's my turn, but it's pretty unlikely. Um, and I just don't have any good options, because I think when this guy goes off, he's going to take out my injured Terminator. And even if he didn't, I can't shoot him, because I will lose my card. Yuck. Okay. Uh, I kind of have to shoot him, but then what is this second? Yeah, there's, there's no way out of this. Um, yeah, because if I do range, this guy kills my Terminator and then promptly kills me. So we're going to go ahead and go for it. I certainly don't have enough to kill him, but it's close. And that's one of those things where when you're deck building, you can be like, all right, this is a good build. I could, I would have won this if Skulltaker was like two levels higher and had just a hair more melee damage. I could have done that lethal. But um, it doesn't help me right now. <laughs> that's right. Okay, so we're three and two. That was never going to be a good matchup. You can't out melee that. You can't out psychic that. Uh, that's something you take on with a shooting deck, and that's just not what you're going to do with a skull taker. Uh, just to do so, I'm going to play one more game, but first I want to talk about some alternative options. A couple other things that I considered was going heavy death blow and heavy ranged. So you can have a melee deck that just leans on ranged attacks as well as kind of a backup, and that gives you a little bit more depth than a deck like this where you have your one Psyker doing a lot of stuff there. You also can go heavy on Psykers, but that doesn't fill in the gap of durability, which is what Skulltaker really, really needs. Um, but if you wanted to tweak this, one of the cards I would lean on is going to be this guy. Got that death blow, got a really high melee, good hit points, and has regen and a very good ranged attack. This is a great mainstay piece if you're at level 7 or higher with that rank 3 regen. Uh, really good. Takes a while to bring down, comes in at a nice price point, has a very respectable ranged and melee attack. This is exactly the kind of piece you want to do in kind of a mid-rangey, kind of like evened, averaged out um, Skull Taker deck. Another great piece is going to be this guy. Of course, he's got a psychic attack, has fear, has a bunch of hit points, uh, and then does have a decent melee attack as well. Uh, really gives you a chance to counterattack in psychic or build up your stuff the same way I've been doing with the Lord of Change. Comes at the higher price point, so he's tough to balance with other pieces, um, and just is going to be out meleeed and out psychered by most other cards in the game, but has a nice balance of abilities that can be really good here. Uh, let's see. Those are some kind of big ones. Of course, another option to do would be this one. Um, just really spectacular stats across the board, and that really high rank fear makes it a very powerful piece anywhere doesn't have some of the advantages of the Lord of Change, the biggest one being that ability to strip shields, which is really key, and take out injured cards from off lane, um, but still a really good piece. Uh, and then this guy also is just a generally very, very good filler in a Skulltaker deck. I talked about how his ability supercharges your medium to low attack melee cards, and 40 is very respectable on an 11-point card with fear. Uh, really low hit points, though, so this guy's best if you have a little bit of taunt and a little bit of uh, Medicaid in there, too. Uh, okay, we're going to play one more game. We'll see how it goes. I'm going to hope I can get another bad matchup so I can get some good metrics. Um, but I feel pretty good about this. Ooh, perfect. we got to watch Captain Artemis. Artemis is very, very challenging, especially right now. Your typical Artemis deck just has really good stats. Usually going to be a full deck. Artemis himself is cheap. Most of the cards you would include in here are cheap. We're going to go ahead and go for it. Uh, and just so you're going to face a full deck that just has a lot of different things it's able to do. How many 
many shields you got? You got three shields. Blah. Gross. Tigris is going to be an issue, but that's the thing, is that when you go up against an Artemis deck, it could be anything. It could be any combination of Space Marine heroes, likely at least one epic and or legendary, probably more. Um, Tigris is one you don't see that often in Artemis decks, but he's certainly there. Some of the other ones you would see being, um, of course, Njal, but then just your sort of shielded melee bashers. And they tend to be very good at pretty much everything. They have decent range, they usually have some level of psychic, and they have very, very good melee. But because their alternative attack stats are good, they end up being a really bad matchup for pretty much everyone. <laughs> uh, especially top-heavy decks like this one, where the longer the Lord of Change is on the board, the more he's going to be hit by Artemis' ability especially if I'm doing well. So this is a deck that actually punishes you if you counter it well, and kind of is a little forgiving if you just really uh, slow roll it. Uh, hmm, settled in front of Yeah, we're gonna do it. Because if your cards are staying on the board longer, it will turn an uphill fight into a down, it will hurt, it will turn a winning fight into an uphill one, is more what I'm trying to say here because um, Artemis' ability is just triggering naturally as you're going. So with Artemis on board, if I see a lot of Artemis, I probably would consider swapping some of these cards around to include some more Medicaid and Taunt, uh, just so I'm not getting kind of beat up in the same way. Like, look at how much the Lord of Change really got wrecked here. And he's still got a pretty stacked deck. And this guy still has 45, yikes. And if he plays another card, if it hits the Lord of Change, it did. Yeah, so uh, this is the matchup I was most concerned about out of the gate and knew was going to be a bad one just because of the kind of deck that Artemis can build. Now, I did take down Tigurius, and I still have four cards, so I'm not out of this yet, depending on what those last couple bodyguards are, but it doesn't look great. It doesn't look awful, but it doesn't look great. And now I'm placing my Silas over here because he has the melee to actually take out this guy on the left. Let's see, what is his melee? 32? It's not awful. 40, 50, 40, X. Okay. And this is one where I want to get that kill on the right to pull this last card in case it has shield so I can poison it if possible and kind of clear the way to Artemis himself. Skulltaker has a reasonable matchup against Artemis if Artemis deploys first. Oh, that's bad. Okay. <laughs> that, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, perfect object lesson that Artemis also is your warlord who you're going to see probably carry the most shields. Um, almost of anyone, even more than an Acheran. Space Marines just have a lot of shields available, and Artemis has no reason not to pack the deck with a lot of shields. He kind of does. Kind of being that, um, again, the deck benefits if its cards are dying a little bit, but if they don't have to, why let your cards die? Oh, yikes, okay. Yes, he got me good. Uh, the biggest thing being the Lord of Change went down really quickly um, because Artemis. So if you see Artemis across the table in a deck build like this one, just you are going to lose. And here he can just shoot me to death oh, without any kind of penalty at all. So I have to do something drastic like melee attacks, which I will be cut to ribbons doing. But I got to do it. And depending on the level of this Artemis, he probably is going to target acquired me and I have no chance. Does not. Okay, so he's not high enough level to get a secondary trait for that. Um, what is that? Target acquired or the, the target acquired versus the warlords that he gets, which makes him a terrifying combatant. Uh, Artemis is one of the most powerful warlords in the game, hands down. Period. Just because his ability just does damage, and he can just stack the deck with good stuff that does everything. Um, extremely good warlord. If you're struggling with a warlord to kind of carry you a little bit, uh, just to kind of play the game and and really enjoy it, some variety of games. Artemis is a great pick. <laughs> so much for my 12k. Um, all right, and I know the video is getting a little bit long, but I'm gonna do one more game, just to kind of see, uh, and we'll see if I can make that back. This is the challenge of laddering late season, especially if you're experimenting, because you are gonna have a wins and losses that, oh, bad truck, excellent, I wanted to see this matchup. Uh, you're gonna have kind of a wins and loss ratio that's gonna be about even. And one of the things that makes it hurt a little bit is, like I mentioned before, a lot of your losses are going to be against decks that are very, very powerful and not appropriately rated. So they may actually be a lot more dangerous than they look on paper. Okay, great. 
Uh, hmm. And Badruk has a little variety, but not a ton. Almost every Badruk deck you're gonna see is gonna have your Barrage card, because holy crap, that thing is stupid. I'm just gonna call it like it is. Uh, and this Taunt card. Because this is just an incredibly good Taunt card, especially with that secondary trait doing the ranged ready, um, and just an absurd number of hit points. You will never ever kill this thing in one round. The only thing that actually kind of counters it is gonna be your um, Votan Warlord that does the Disables abilities. Uh, but then this thing is stupid. I'm gonna call it just, just stupid. In terms of cost and stats and initiative and what it can do with Badrick's ability, it is just incredibly dumb. Um, one of the things that's most problematic about Badrick is that his ability triggers all the time, no matter what. So that this card can get infinite bonus attacks by killing adjacent cards from what it's actually shooting at really, really puts it over the top. Um, I think that that, yeah, that's one of the biggest things to kind of consider about Badruk is you do not want this thing to be doing really hard primary damage or really hard secondary damage because it's just going to kind of rip you to shreds. Um, this is going okay. I don't feel great about it. I'm going to go ahead and clear this. I still have a shielded card, still have the Lord of Change with decent hit points, but it is against Badruk who can snowball quickly, and I have two cards that are low health. So pretty much no matter what, he's going to get multiple... Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. And it's the combination, too. The combination of... It's like he's gonna... Has a board wipe with before he's even played. Um, it's the combination of this guy, which is really scary, but yeah, has some limitations you can work around, and then the barrage card both being in the same decks that really makes this guy really, really over the top. I uh, have beef with Badrick. Couple just sort of general tactics to talk about with Badrak. Uh, you want to put your injured cards in a situation where they will die in melee, so that they don't die in ranged. So that's something to keep in mind. I've got this one, but I still can grumble about it. <laughs> I say I've got it. Watch him kill me, shoot me like nine times. Um, the only reason I have this game is because I have shields, and because this card on the left is not the Barrage card. If that was the buggy that was doing the Barrage damage adjacent to Skulltaker, he probably would be dead by now, just because of that overflow damage. Uh, yeah, so we got that. And that was a pretty standard bad wreck, and it was not a weak one. That had good stats, um, had all the kind of usual suspects that you'd expect to see, so that was a, a decent test, and pulled it off, and it wasn't not going to say it wasn't close. It was a pretty close game, but it also was not um, not too bad. Yeah, we're going to play one more. Why not? The deck is working as designed. It doesn't feel like a thematic, fluffy, corn Skulltaker deck, but it's a, a Skulltaker deck that's actually going to win against some of the scarier meta beasts that are out there. So, uh, win some, you lose some. Uh, and this is going to be kind of a weird one. I don't really know what to do with a Yarrick. 2.9k Yarrick. This is someone who probably plays a lot, because that's an unusually high-level Yarrick. <laughs> Can throw you in there. Tank that shot. I'm curious to see what's in here. It's possible. This is someone who paid some money to get the new tank, and that's why they're playing Yarrick, but we'll, we'll see. So I'm going to lean on my... play conservatively, lean on my psychic attacks, because I don't have to worry about this stuff too much yet. I also kind of want to clear the shields off this one on the left before I do anything too drastic. How many shields have got? We've got three. Oh, they're gone. Cool. Still got a shield in my middle guy. I have to be a little concerned about what drops on the left. If it's a really hard-hitting tank, I could be in trouble. Hoping for another endless card. Sort of. Because that um, range attack is already charged worryingly high. We'll see how that goes. Oh, good. Targeted card there. Perfect. That saved my butt. Okay. Had those two cards been flipped, I would have been toast. Or had that target acquired not been on a card with shields, I would have been toast. And even then, wow, that hurt. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Yark, man. He'll get you. Give you a chance. So uh, the Lord of Change is probably toast at this point. I'm doing okay. Um, hopefully drops another endless card, so I have a little time to regen a bit. Perfect. Okay. Still not going to be great. That damage that those deal is not nothing, but it also is not uh, as bad as it could be. 
Sweet. Okay, so this will be an absolute pasting. We're going to pull Yorick himself. Yorick is a little bit less of a concern than some of the other Servants Warlords, but he's still nothing to sneeze at. And he still has two more bodyguards because he's so very cheap. Uh, Yorick can really load up the bodyguards. Okay, could be worse. And is worse. Okay. <laughs> Good news is I still have a full deck. Uh, I still have shields. Um... Bad news is that hurt really hard. Other good news is his offensive bonus is now gone. But we see... <laughs> okay, that's what we have. All right. He's... I think he still got me. And that was... That was weird. Uh, but yeah. But that's exactly the kind of deck that uh, this Skull Taker is going to struggle with. Because it is top-heavy, it is going to really struggle to deal with a deck that... Um, can dish out a whole lot of damage at any single target because that's going to quickly clear through those high defense de uh, cards and really kind of beat up on your critical pieces. Um, well, no, I don't have this. So I'm going to pull Yarrick and then I'm promptly going to die. And so if you do, if you're looking at this, uh, drop me some comments on some of the, the points you would shuffle around and do this differently. This deck build or something else with Skull Taker you have that works really, really well. Uh, I do want to see more of them. This has been pretty effective, but it looks like it's been 50-50. If I'm... Wow, that's a bummer. <laughs> I may just die in melee. Oh, so close. Well, mm -mm. that's not what you want, but... And that, I mean, that was just kind of a rough matchup. It was just a very, very deep deck that had that really, really supercharged single target damage. Uh, and being Yarrick, it didn't have to do... It didn't have to do those Haymaker punches all that many times to really make a difference. So, it is still Skull Taker. Even the build I've got is still a little bit glassy. Uh, so you really need to do to trade um, favorably. So your cards need to kind of all earn more than their points. Uh, yeah. So that was that. Hope you enjoyed my video. Appreciate your time with my deck building. If you want to see deck building with a different warlord or you want to see more of this, whatever, have some feedback, let me know. Until next time.